Hello and welcome to The Mastering Show. My name is Ian Shepard. I'm a mastering engineer and I run the production advice website aimed at helping you get the best results recording, mixing and mastering your music. And with me as always this week is my co-host John Tidy. Hi John, how are you doing? Hey, I'm good. Hello everyone. And we also have a guest this week, a name I'm sure many of you will already be familiar with, Jonathan Weiner, who is a mastering engineer, he's a lecturer at Berkeley, he's written a book, uh, and more recently he's a, a consultant uh, and speaks for Isotope, who of course make Ozone and RX and many other fine audio plugins. Jonathan, welcome to The Mastering Show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to virtually be here. It's great to, to have you here. And I mean, I'm sure most of you listening already know about Jonathan, but just briefly, I mean, he's He's got a fantastic track record. He's worked with bands like Nirvana, um, worked on material by David Bowie, James Taylor, Bruce Springsteen, Miles Davis, and Aerosmith, amongst many others. And um, Jonathan, I've just realised you probably mastered the first Bowie album I really got to know well. I bought I bought a bundle of seven CDs for my 20th birthday, one of which was Hunky Dory. Oh, man. Back in 91, 92. So that was probably your master um, that I was listening to there, which I loved. I mean, that must have been pure pleasure working on those albums. You know, that is one of my favorite records of all time, just period. Same. And so, um, and it was one of those pinch me moments being able to work on that record because I'd been a big Bowie fan when I was a teenager. And, um, and then to turn around some, it was probably 15 years later, um, and be involved in the remastering uh, was pretty amazing. You know, that catalog, it, it, that was a big, big job, which from the, the moment that we unpacked the boxes and, and listened through every existing master we could collect through the, the final QC pass, I probably listened to every one of those records, I'm going to say 15 times, maybe more, in a relatively brief span. I never got tired of them. But, you know, one of my favorite moments working on that project was I, I also got all of the multi-track recordings for that record, which were all done on 2-inch, 16-inch um, by um, Kent Scott at Trident. And I got to solo the string tracks, and I got to hear into the you know Bowie's vocal on the Bewley Brothers without decoding the Dolby, so I heard all of the smoke escaping from his mouth and the creaks and the stool, and it was, it was just spectacular. So it was a pinch me moment, that's for sure. Couldn't believe it. Yeah, I've got to say that's one of the I don't know, I haven't th kind of thought about it directly, but that is one of the s sort of secret little uh, not a guilty pleasure, but there's something special about actually handling master tapes and seeing engineers notes on things in fact i think the guys at abbey road have cottoned onto that i don't know if you've seen the deluxe reissue of the the there was the stereo version of sergeant pepper that they released recently yes um comes in this beautiful box that i mean it has this kind of 3d version of the cover on the front but when you when you kind of take that sleeve off the inside of it is pretty much a replica of the the original box that the reels of of the, of the album would have come in yeah yeah it's it's wild. It's, you know, it's terrifying too, because, you know, it, it, but, you know, nowadays, so long as you back things up well enough, at least for a period of time, uh, you figure you can get it back. But man, <laughs> you know, you open up a, a reel and it's got foil around it and there's this smell that comes out and then you put it up on the machine and you just, you know, you, you treat it with all the care it requires, but you're never really sure if it's the last time that the tape would stand being played. So... There was one time I remember where uh, I think the tape had been baked um, and basically the edits had just dried out completely oh, and I had no idea. It was on rewind and the thing just exploded all over the studio. <laughs> um, it took me three and a half hours to untangle this and it was a quarter inch reel as well. So it was fragile tape, you know, just kind of working at fingertips, just doing my absolute utmost not to touch anything. It survived. I mean, that's that's the great thing about analog tape is it doesn't die when that happens. Well, that's right. But somebody should write this, you know, a short piece about things not to do when you're opening up a box with an analog reel inside. Um, for instance, if you've got pancake, which is the reel without the flanges, don't just mm -hmm. pick it up without knowing whether or not it's going to hold together, for instance. <laughs> yeah, because the, the answer is it won't. <laughs> it, well, it... it 
hopefully it does, but if it doesn't, I saw this happen once, and somebody spent about eight hours spooling the, the tape back onto the, the machine. So anyway, we, I know this isn't a, a show about analog tape, but um, I, if anybody out there wants to write that piece, I think you should go for it. I, I think you're right. It's, John, have you, have you done any stuff with, with analog tape, or are you, have you always done stuff in digital? Always digital. I, I feel like I'm, in some ways I feel like I'm missing out, but other times I'm like, I, I know what can go wrong so easily with analog tape that I've just, I kind of feel lucky at the same time that I haven't. I think that's, that's a very sensible attitude. <laughs> you know, tape was a, a, a phenomenon and you had to develop a certain skill set to record to it and to align machines. It was a little bit like working on an old car be back before there were, you know, IC chips in cars where you could tune them by hand with a screwdriver and a wrench. But otherwise, I think you're, you're pretty lucky, John, that, uh, <laughs> that you get to do, you know, if you have an eight second crossfade possible, I mean, like, what more do you need? What more could you ask for in life? <laughs> I just remember the stories <laughs> of, of guys editing multi-track with razor blades. I mean, that must have taken courage. You know, it's like, it's one thing for us to kind of just put this thing on and play back probably a stereo version but yeah the guys who were splicing oh i love that I, it was so much fun to do and such a again it's very satisfying it's a very hands-on mechanical kind of thing yeah there's a, there's a real satisfaction as well in the, the way the machines work just kind of just admiring the engineering i mean it's hopelessly nerdy but yeah. i just you know every time you kind of put a studio in and out of fast water rewind and it just stopped on a dime it was it was a pleasure so you, yeah because you started out as a recording engineer jonathan so you were working on analog tape back in those days that's right. Well, I started out as a musician. Right. This is something I didn't know we had in common, because you're a French horn player, that's right? I am. That was my major in college, along with composition. Whereas I'm, I'm a lapsed trombone player. Um, so That's my favorite kind. <laughs> um, actually, I love, yes. I love the trombone, <laughs> but um, much more than I like the French horn. But um, in the context of being a musician, when I was in college, I spent a lot of time composing using quarter-inch four-track and bouncing Ooh. from tape to tape. And that was my introduction to recording technology along with some electrocomp modular synthesizers and then an ARP 2600 and things of that sort. So that was my first contact with the marriage of music and technology. So uh, music concrete, yes, making music out of recorded sounds, is that? Yes, absolutely. Well, I also had the keys to the recital hall. So after a little while, I figured out which way to point a microphone. So we, we made some recordings and then mistreated them in the studio and then went and played them on the radio station at the college where I was. And um, that was a blast. I did one piece of, uh, of music concrete, which was part of my, my college course. Um, we, we just had to write, compose a piece of music. So anybody listening who doesn't know, it's basically pre-sampling technology. You would, you would have your sample, which was a piece of tape. You would play back that tape at different speeds to change the pitch and allow you to, in inverted commas, play notes and then edit the stuff together. So I, I had a recording of a sheep that came from a BBC <laughs> sound effects record and I made it sing Bar Bar Black Sheep, except that the, the sheep didn't hold pitch very well. Um, no so sheep it, ever it does, a, Ian. Well, no, the, the modern ones do because they have auto-tune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you started out as a musician. You, I've heard you say before that you kind of you didn't feel you were good enough at that, and that's how you got into production and recording. Was it production first or was it recording? Um, it was recording. You know, it's interesting. It's Sometimes it's hard to, to separate the two. But, um, yeah, I think it was a combination of two things. I really did fall in love with the way that uh, technology amplified and extended our capabilities for music making and, and manipulation. So, you know, I, there, there was an honest kind of love of the technology, but yeah, I was not going to be, set the world on fire with my French horn playing. So it was a good out. Yeah, same for me with the trombone playing, except I think you got to a much higher standard than I did. What was it that moved you across to mastering? I, I know that you kind of started out right at the beginning of when the digital tools uh, started to become available. Was that what prompted it? Um, or was that just kind of what happened to be there at the time that you made the shift? Well, it was kind of both. I mean, the fact that the tools um, were just coming online made it fascinating and interesting and a very exciting time. Um, and I got a job offer. So uh, to go to work as a production engineer and a, a Q QC engineer in a mastering facility, and so it was kind of a, just, you know, a 
happenstance in a way, but um, I think there were certain things that made me well suited to going into mastering. I think my um, diverse interests musically suited me as a mastering engineer. You know, I think um, you, as a mastering engineer, certainly back in that time, and I think even today, if you're working at it full time, you have to be um, able to understand a vast cross section and, and appreciate the musical values in a vast cross section of musical styles. So I was working on everything from classical music to reggae and dub and rock and, you know, everything in between. I mean, it was much more tedious back in the day because of all of the, the times you'd have to rewind the, the pneumatic videotape and listen back through a yeah. record. But it's, it's a long form practice where you have to sit and listen to the same thing many times all the way through very critically. And I was able to tolerate that. And um, so I think it was a combination of of kind of interest and fascination with the tools and exciting new technology and, and also personality. I, I don't know that it makes sense for everybody to want to do something like mastering. No, I'd agree. I mean, and I've actually, I won't bore John again with the story. I've said before that I, with hindsight, I kind of feel like I was, I don't want to say born a mastering engineer, but I always had those tendencies, you know, I was kind of a bit obsessive about it, um, kind of really getting into the, the nitty gritty and things. I mean, John, I know that you're really interested in mastering and, and kind of fascinated in getting quite experienced at it. Do you think it comes naturally to you or you feel more comfortable in the recording and mixing area? I'm fairly comfortable with all aspects of it, but like tracking a, a band is fun because it's all just like see your pants, like what's going to go wrong. You never quite know what you're going to get. That's kind of the most fun for me. And I do that very rarely because it's so stressful. Um, but mastering is, but I like mastering a lot because it's, it's, it's a very focused uh, exercise. You can listen to a single frequency of, of a song and kind of like just get lost in it. And sometimes you zone out and you just, you listen to the whole album and, and you've barely made any changes at all. And right. you're just enjoying the music. And do you ever kind of feel that sense of frustration that Jonathan's, talking about that maybe it's kind of like, oh, I have to listen to this again, or, you know, I'm doing this again because there was this click or that dropout, whatever. I, I definitely don't do it as much as, uh, as Jonathan. It's still a very exciting for me because it's, it's not something that I do every day. Right. Or even every week, maybe. Yeah. I don't want to so. o overplay the, the tedium, but it's just a long, it's a long form, um, you know, mixing your sort of jumping around between sections of a tune, you're, uh, there, there's a lot more creativity and a lot more invention. And I think that um, mastering is much more about being an active listener uh, than any other part of the process, I would say. I, I absolutely agree with John that, you know, when you're tracking a band, you're in the moment and you're seeing the performance and you can coach the performance. And as you know, you're, you're really, um, you're constrained in terms of what you can do in mastering. Um, little moves can go a long way and you can subtly enhance balance and, you know, the impression of, uh, dynamics or depth or, or whatever it is, but it's, um, it's a, it's a different state of being. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause actually I've often thought that I don't have the patience to be a tracking or mix engineer. I oh, like, that's interesting. Yep. I like the fact that with mastering, I guess just because however many times you might have to listen, maybe not with the kind of a like a restoration project. I remember there was one set of, I was going to say Herbie Hancock, I don't think it was him. Anyway, it was an old kind of older jazz thing where we were restoring stuff that was coming in from vinyl and we literally spent days or possibly weeks on the restoration just taking out all the crackle and clicks and all that kind of stuff and then got onto the mastering. So in those cases, it can take what it feels like forever. Yes. But usually you're kind of done in a day or maybe two days. Maybe there's some revisions a bit further down the line. So I kind of quite like that aspect of it. Well, I like that aspect of it too. I, as a mix engineer before I was mastering, you know, I would spend a couple of weeks on a record and I would do my best to bring all my craft to the record, but not every record I worked on was my favorite, but I was still going to spend all that time on that record. So in, in mastering for better or worse, you're often, as you say, it's, it's a, a relationship that lasts a day. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, unlike tracking where you're going to hear the song played the wrong way, 50 times <laughs> before they get it right. No offense to the mus musicians, but with mastering, the song is already done and it sounds good usually when you get started on it. So 
you're just enhancing things and getting it ready for the album. You're generally not hearing them make mistakes over and over and over because that's all been taken care of. So for me, that's nice. That is nice. I agree with you. It's true. I mean, it's an interesting point, Jonathan, you say that possibly mastering isn't for everybody. I mean, when I started mastering, nobody really knew what it was. Part of the the first contact you often had with a client was explaining the process to the, you know, especially if they're independent artists rather than signed to a label. Um, whereas these days, everybody at least thinks they know what mastering is and has probably kind of had a had a crack at it. I'm aware that there's a paradox because, you know, I'm a mastering engineer. I've been a mastering engineer for 20 years, but I also run a website and make plugins that help other people do a better job of doing it themselves. So there's a kind of slight conflict there, I guess. I don't think so. I think it's a total, totally consonant, quite frankly. I mean, I understand the point that you're making, but I I believe that it's um, the fact that you're bringing all of your good experience to bear in creating tools, and this may segue nicely into some of the things we'll talk about later, but creating tools that help people learn how to do a better job is fantastic. And, you know, I just also want to thank both you guys for uh, having this podcast and, um, you know, giving sort of good, well-vetted, informed information to people who are hungry for it. I think that the level of sophistication and knowledge about many things, audio production, including mastering, has risen so much over the last several years. Um, But um, I'm sure you have people who want to come work with you, Ian, because you're you. Um, And then you have other people who want to learn from you because you're giving them good information. And that's fantastic. Yeah, that's true. And actually, you're you're absolutely right. You spotted my segue before I did it, which was that I was going to ask how, I mean, I'm guessing I kind of already know what your answer is going to be because you're now working with Isotope, again, on tools that help people do a, a better job of all of this stuff. But the truth is something like Ozone or Rx uh, can be overused. Um, you know, I mean, the obvious things like pushing the loudness too high with with multiband compression and limiting. But in RX, if people do what I would consider excessive denoising, for example, or uh, you know, just use some of the automated processing, and it's it has some side effects that maybe they're not aware of. There is this risk that all of these things that we make available to people can cause damage rather than make the music better. I'm thinking, I'm imagining you would say that, you know, the world is a better place with those things there to help the people who can hear make improvements and everybody else just has to be careful. Limiters don't kill dynamics. People do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that that's exactly right. There, the, the, the fact of the matter is that it, it is inevitable as time goes on and the technology improves that we can use a heavier hand in signal processing with fewer artifacts than we used to be able to. And I think, Ian, you and I have talked about that moment that was when we first started having look-ahead limiters. Before we had the digital limiter in the early 90s, if you pushed as much level into an analog limiter as we do now, it would sound horrible. Nobody would listen to it. Nobody would want to do it. But then that limiter came along, and you could. And while the artifact, we we can debate whether or not the artifact of it is unpleasant or how far is too far or all of that, the fact of the matter is you can push level more than you used to be able to, and it doesn't sound as bad. And so, Mm. you know, the technology is always going to let us do more interesting and different things, which brings us really to what I think is underneath what you're saying, which is you've got to take everything that you're doing in context. There's an artistic context, uh, artistic intent you know, you, you talk about um, level as it relates to loudness and loss of dynamics. That's something that needs to be managed in a way that it helps the music as opposed to hurts it. And then there's a bunch of other issues like what the clients want. But we have to understand the context of what we're doing. And when you understand it and when you are, are doing good work that sounds good, having great tools is awesome. You know, you'd rather cut a, a piece of cheese with a sharp knife than a blunt instrument, right? I mean, so it's good to have the sharp knife. Yeah, I agree. And there's a, I wasn't planning to ask this question, but you you mentioned in there the element of what the client wants. Um, And it can be a dangerous question, so we might have to edit it out. But I'm curious where you, where you stand on that. So for me, when I, when a new client comes to me these days, one of the first questions I ask is, how loud 
uh, in inverted commas, they want the music to be. Um, and if they, you know, if that's kind of a question, they're not quite sure how to answer, I then ask for, for some references so that I can you know, listen to what they're listening to and see the kind of goalpost they have in their mind. And if that is uh, beyond what I feel is going to serve the music, then I kind of say, you know, listen, I'm, I'm really sorry, you know, I don't want to disappoint you, but I, I honestly don't think I'm going to enjoy wor working on this if that's your goal. And there are other people who, who will enjoy it more and get you a better result, probably. You'd probably do better to, to speak to somebody else. How about you? Where do you stand on that? Because there are other engineers I know who kind of feel that the client is always right and it's their music and they should be allowed. I mean, I'm not saying they shouldn't be allowed to do whatever they want with their music. It's just that I choose not to work on some projects. Um, on the other hand, the you know mastering engineers, we have always been at the end of the chain. To some extent, what we do is kind of advisory. I feel like if you're in the position where you're telling your mastering engineer what they should do, the question is why you went to them in the first place. <laughs> uh, that's not really a question, but what do you think of that topic? Well, my feeling is that, yes, the client always gets to make the final decision. And it's, it is absolutely our responsibility to advise them and educate them to the extent that they're willing to be educated and give them some options and, and portray the options in a way that's intelligent. Um, but they get to make the final decision. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. It's a collaboration, but, but they are in charge. I think that there are some people who are better suited from a, an aesthetic standpoint to work with more restricted dynamic range, if you will. I'm trying not to be judgmental in my language, but some people make records hotter, th better than others. There's a craft to it. And I actually, it, in some ways, and I, I almost feel guilty admitting this, but I, I admire the craft around that, um, oh, no, I but, agree. but I don't necessarily enjoy the result. So I'll always do my best to get the clients what I think they want. I will give them some options where they can hear the differences, you know, that extra dB or two doesn't matter, and, and what's it going to do to the, the result, and then at the end of the day, let them make the decision. The great thing, as you know, is that with a few exceptions... Um, the, the whole argument for doing it is going away and things are changing. Um, and we've been seeing it over the last few years. And I think that that change is accelerating right now. And, you know, I feel a responsibility to make sure that I alert a client to, to uh, a problem that a decision that they're forcing might cause, whether it's a loss of dynamics or whether they want, you know, you want that much 3K in your master, in your female pop record. Well, that's fine. Let's you know, listen to it on a phone speaker or listen to it coming out of a laptop or, God forbid, earbuds, and people may want to turn your record down, it might be counterproductive. You know, what are you going to do? I mean, people, it's art, right? I think, John, you said earlier, nobody's going to die from using a, overuse of a limiter. Um, it's a collaboration. We don't, we don't have all the right answers. We just, we just know a lot of stuff and we can create context for the decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned there the I mean, you were referring to the fact that so much music is being played online these days, is being streamed, and therefore, you know, my hope, and I, I think probably your hope as well, is that the the loudness management, the, the normalization that they're using will kind of remove the incentive for people to make their music extremely loud on the way in, because it'll just, it'll be reversed on playback, so there won't be any benefit to that. I think I've heard you talk before about the new mastering assistant in Ozone has some presets for different uh, suggested targets. So, for example, for online streaming or for CD instead. I mean, personally, I still do one master that I think works for all of the formats. Uh, it's it's dynamic enough to take advantage of the online streaming services and the, the kind of the headroom that they have, but loud enough that my clients are happy with it on CD. Um, and I'm just curious whether when you're mastering what your preference is. I mean, obviously, if a client says, I would like a version optimized for Spotify or YouTube or wherever, and another one for CD that they want differently, then I'd be happy to do that, as I'm sure you would. But what's your preference? Well, I absolutely agree with you. It's, it's, there, there are two issues. One is preference, which is for every record to sound as good as possible. Um, but then there's also keeping myself sane. 
um, because if you were to optimize a record for every format out there, you'd have to generate 10 different masters of every record, and that's just not doable. Thankfully, I think that you can use a, a fairly rational target, like what you're describing, whether it's you know an overall integrated loudness of you know, minus 12 or whatever it happens to be, uh, that'll translate reasonably well. And if somebody wants you to add a little more gain on the back end for it to be put on a CD, you can do that. Um, so you can use the target as something of a pivot point to go up or to come down a little bit. Um, that's, of course, leaving out the extreme cases. If somebody wants something that's going to play at, a, at an EDM festival where it's going to be peak normalized on a huge sound system and it really does need to be set to, you know, RMS minus six or whatever the heck, um, that strategy won't work anymore. You really have to, to master to that particular target. And I do think that if you're mastering for vinyl, it's, it's a good idea to run a se separate version with little to no limiting. But otherwise, I think the idea of a, a single level that will serve most masters uh, is an excellent suggestion. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, and, and I'm actually as part of the education process with my EDM clients, I do try and gently suggest that they could have a special version for the festivals where they're concerned that the DJ won't be able to play it loud enough um, and not necessarily, I'm going to use the word inflict that <laughs> on everybody who buys the, the CD or, or downloads the file. Tools, technology have always influenced music production. You know, I mean, even if you think about something like guitar pedals, Lindrum, auto-tune, all of those things have shaped the music that people make and the technology influences mastering as well because, like you say, the fact that we've now got look-ahead limiters means that you can push the level that much higher with less damage and therefore people do. Um, but again, in, in terms of EDM, I have people telling me all the time that the, the genre now requires that um, heavily limited sound, you know, that RMS minus six and higher to sound right. And that's something that I always push back against, but I'm aware that that's possibly just me. And uh, yeah, I was just curious about your, your kind of point of view on it. Yeah, I think I basically agree with you, Ian. I think um, the issue of playback level as opposed to uh, the, the quality or fidelity of an audio production are really two different things. And if, if playback level is king and queen, then um, you really can't get away from from driving the limiter that hard. But if you deconstruct what the limiter, that amount of limiting is actually getting you in terms of sustained RMS, especially in the bass, I mean, in order to get as much persistent and consistent low end into a mix as is required in the genre, you have to deal with the initial transient phase of any instrument, right? I mean, we're always playing this trade-off between peak and average. Right, what you you would call PLR in your in mm -hmm. your uh, plugin, right? And so um, that's where the, the limiter is really coming into play to help you manage that musical relationship, and and that doesn't require that you be all the way up at the top of the scale. That just requires that you be attending to the musical value of the mix. So I totally agree with you. Excellent. I'm very happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and we may both be deluding ourselves, but I'm happy to be here with you. <laughs> I, well, I, I guess uh, this could be a challenge for the, for the listeners. I've yet to find an example where it isn't possible to get the sound of a genre. I mean, people to say the same thing about metal. Um, I mean, there's some metal, I'm happy to say these days, that actually is really quite dynamic. Um, but there's also, you know, the kind of the, the versions, the, the subgenres where the extreme levels are, are still there. Um, and again, people, um, you, you know, say that it has to be part of the sound in order to, to get the aggression or to get the density or to whatever it is. Um, but there's a, I forget that we can put the link to it in the show notes. There's an example I found somewhere where quite a well-known producer um, released or made available two different versions of uh, a project he was working on, one of which was really, really limited and the other wasn't and when you edit between the two you can barely hear a difference because you know a great brick wall limiter when it's working really well actually is pretty invisible yeah sonically um so yeah it's, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir i realize that so I'll, <laughs> we can leave that uh tack now the the whole issue of i mentioned the ozone mastering assistant 
Um, I haven't had the chance to play with it. John, have you, have you used it? I haven't. I'm a few versions behind on both Ozone and RX. I mean, they, they work so well in the older versions that I, I don't feel like I, I need the new stuff. But I'm sure it's great. You I can I mean? hear the smile in your yeah. I can hear the smile yeah, in you your voice. Hear, you could tell that's not deliberate ozone back scratching. I completely agree. I stuck with I was on version five maybe for for ages. I have recently upgraded, although I don't, I'm not on the latest version. Jonathan, I'm, yes. I think I'm right in saying that the mastering assistant is uh, it's kind of it, it offers you an intelligent starting point. Yes, is that the way it's intended to work? That is exactly the intention behind the tool. Um, I'm embedded in the conversations at Isotope. Um, fortunately, I don't have to make all the decisions. I, I get to be a small voice among many in, in deciding how things work and what they should do. But there's a very strong commitment to the idea that an assistant should help you with tasks that are sort of easily quantifiable to get you to a good starting point, to leave you at a, at a point where you can start making more interesting and creative decisions, and maybe teach you something about the, uh, the tracks that you're working with. But they're meant to be assistive. They're not meant to be automated. Um, you know, people, people sometimes are um, inclined to think about uh, the sort of automated tools uh, or assistive tools as automated or taking away choices or doing things for us. And, and that's absolutely not the intention. Um, so I, I would not suggest that somebody rely on the master assistant to master the record. I think it's a great way to get a good starting point, get some initial thoughts about overall tonal shift, uh, level set, and probably the most interesting thing that the, the master assistant does, and it's something that I actually would rely on the master assistant and not try to do this myself because it's so good at it, is that it parks a dynamic EQ before the final limiter to pull down some of the resonant peaks in the, the, the level of the track before it gets to the limiter so the limiter isn't working as hard. Um, and it's a, it's a neat sort of way of thinking about the interaction between the input signal and the limiter. Interesting. Would you EQ first and then apply that to deal with anything that might still be left? Or would you put it in the chain first and then EQ based on what you hear? Typically what I've been doing is I'll, if I use it, and you know I don't want to make it sound like that's my only platform. I, I am the education director at Isotope, but I, I have plenty of other tools and other, other um, hardware pieces as well. Um, mm. But when I use it, I'll run it on a track. It's important that you run it on a fairly dense section in a track to you know, so that the limiter is dealing with something that's at the top of the dynamic range as opposed to lower, because otherwise it's going to suggest way too much level into the limiter. Um, so run it for, it takes about 10 seconds. It looks at the level, sets the dynamic EQ. It, it will apply compression only if there's a real aberration in terms of dynamic range. It, it, I, I would say 80 or 90% of the time it turns off the compression, none needed. Um, because tracks will fall within bounds of what's kind of okay, um, and then suggest a little broad brushstroke EQ. I'll listen to that EQ. Sometimes I just turn it off. I might find it interesting as a suggestion for what to do, but I'll, I'll turn that off and then and then pick up from there. But then I've got I've got this preset that's customized for my audio between the limiter and the dynamic EQ. That's quite useful. Interesting. I might have to. You might just have tempted me to uh, upgrade and experiment with well, that. Well, I would love. To, I would love to know what you think of it. I mean, you know, you can you can just download a demo and use that for ten days or something. It's a neat tool, and it's you know, hats off to the developers. Yeah, I mean, I love that idea as well. I mean, John has talked before about how he used uh, one of the room correction software packages, not in the end to correct his monitoring chain, but just to figure out really what it was that he needed to do to improve his monitoring. Both of the plugins I've developed are kind of, they're not so much educational, but they're intended to help people make good decisions. Yep. And I think that's what Neutron does as well, right? I, the, it suggests, you know, where there might be EQ conflicts in the mix. I think all of these ideas are really clever and interesting, much more so than just another EQ plugin or just another compressor or whatever. Or in an 1176. Yeah, right. A millionth time. Right. That's right. I mean, that's one of the things I love about technology is as it, as it evolves, 
it gives us has the potential to give us greater insight and and more choices in our work um, and and better tools presumably um, and so um, the the ability to analyze a signal and compare it in in the case of um, there's a, an environment that's in neutron two and ozone eight called tonal balance control and what it really is is a very sophisticated meter. Um, the meter is informed by having put thousands and thousands and thousands of tracks into a neural network, have it learn the typical spectrum of recorded sound over a period of a couple of decades, and in some case we constrain the genre, and then uh, with, with a, a, a dynamic range, sort of a typical dynamic range, and you can take a track and play it into this meter and see how it compares to what's commonplace, right? It's not telling you what to do, but it's a measurement tool. But the only reason we've been able to do this is our ability to process all of this data and mm -hmm. and sort of tease out some interesting attributes about, you know, what, what seems to be music that people have recorded and released, in other words, good sound over the last X number of decades. And so... Um, you know that it's fascinating that we're able to do that. In in a way, it's for me, it's like an, an, just an evolved VU meter or an evolved. I mean, you know, we we've always had these kinds of tools that will help us navigate certain aspects of the challenges in recording, and this is just like next level, next generation tools. No, I I completely agree, I, and I think you probably answered the the next question I was going to ask, which was there seem to be lots of people who almost want. I'm not still thinking so much of of the mastering assistant in Ozone anymore, but the you know the online automated mastering services like Aria and uh, Lambda, um, Cloud Bounce. The, I definitely talk to some people who want those to be as good as humans. I kind of feel fundamentally they never can be. I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts, which is not a music podcast, is called the You Are Not So Smart podcast. Um, anybody listening who likes having their mind expanded, I strongly recommend you check it out. Um, there was just a replayed episode recently where he was talking to James Burke, who's a kind of very f famous documentary maker. And uh, he was talking about the debate, you know, with, with computers that can beat Gary Kasparov playing chess. And Kasparov has said, but I would be better if I had access to the same database that that computer has. And that's very much James Burke's point of view, is that the machines plus a human will always be better than the machine on its own. And I think that's what I believe. I was curious to know how good you think the machines can get. Oh, I think they can become enormously good at, at certain kinds of tasks. This is something I feel very strongly about. I think that there are contexts within which automated sort of services are great and probably better than people. Let's take self-driving cars, right? I believe that machines will do a better job of driving on average than people do and avoiding accidents and fatalities. I just, I think that that's true. I think they will get better than we can be. And I'm a fan of that technology. Now, if I want to just get in my BMW and drive down a country road on a sunny day and put the top down and be in control, I don't want that machine. If I want to make a beautiful piece of music and make a beautiful recording and, and get better at my craft, there's only so much I'm willing to give up to the machine. That's the, the whole point of being creative is, is being creative, right? So, so if we're just looking to get to a particular result, machines ought to be able to do it as well as we can, if not better in certain respects. But that's not why we're here. That's not what we're doing. So I guess I come back around and say, yeah, once again, I agree with you. I think the machine will augment our acuity, our capabilities, you know, keep us out of trouble when we're in the eighth hour of a mix and we've completely lost our way and help us understand better what we've been doing or maybe tell us it's time to take a break. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's not art. It's not music. It's not the, you know, we love this because we love the craft. Right, and so that may be another reason why we're just not that interested in making an automated service. That's not the point. The point is to help people be happier and more effective in their work, and maybe help them learn some things. Yep, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, maybe it's just me attracting 
people who want the machines to succeed because I'm kind of fairly publicly saying that I don't think that they can. Um, you know, and so I, I effectively, I'm just attracting, I don't know, yeah, people who want to to prove me wrong. But I, it kind of feels weird to me that anybody would want that, like you say, because, yeah, just like you would want to drive a convertible with the top down, you know, where's the satisfaction in music if the machine did all of the heavy lifting for you? The whole, you know, the the fun of mastering or recording or mixing or all the rest of it is is putting the hours in, putting the effort in and coming up with something that that, that you feel proud of. Here's the problem, the very difficult problem, and that is understanding artistic intent. So how do, how do you break that down? I mean, we, you know, we think about these things a lot um, when we think about making tools that are informed by machine learning or artificial intelligence or, you know, whatever you want to call it. There are certain things that are knowable. You can understand level on a meter. You can understand frequency dispersion. You can understand the interaction between two different parts of signal flow. You can understand what's going to happen when you play something through an amplifier to a speaker. Can you understand what's going on inside the brain of a creative when they're making a decision? Well, we're a ways away from that, <laughs> and I don't know how we get there. I'm sure there are people who are working on that issue, but it's a much harder thing to understand intent and to then allow for all of the different ways that that could manifest. And so, I mean, thank goodness, that's part of the joy, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we're in complete agreement. That would be a great place to to stop the show. But uh, just before we started talking, you mentioned um, that you were, well, listeners, um, Jonathan is recording <laughs> himself in triplicate for this podcast, which beats <laughs> both John and I. We both record ourselves twice, just in case something goes wrong with the Skype connection. Uh, Jonathan has got three copies going uh, with two mics, so he even has a redundant microphone. But one of those copies is going to the, the Spire recording device which is a kind of a new thing to come out of uh isotope that i i don't know much about can you just it's a little kind of standalone recording device right well connected and standalone yes so the spire its main reason for existing its raison d'etre is to be a high quality eight track sketchpad for musicians to record anywhere when they have a creative impulse or whether in it when they're in a place where they don't have a proper setup in front of them. And so there are a number of different ways of thinking about this. Some of it has to do with, you know, the friction of setting up a laptop and an interface and a microphone and by the time you're done, you know, you've sort of lost the moment. Um, but it's it's infinitely portable. And so from that perspective it's that, that sort of describes one facet of it. But there are two other things that I think are important uh, to say about the tool. One is it's very high quality. I just actually shot an interview with Mike Grace of Grace Design, and they consulted on the mic preamp design in the tool, and it sounds fantastic. So there's a commitment to quality in something that's both convenient and it has an excellent small form factor. Um, the other thing is that it is connected via mesh network to an iOS device, and you can control it from the device. And when you're done, you can immediately generate a quick mix or export the tracks via Wi-Fi, via Dropbox, whatever you like. So you can pull it into Pro Tools, and you know, let's say you're out making a, a neat little four-track sketch, and you want to replace the tracks or add to them in your DAW. You can do it very simply. So it's it's got a great facility. Uh, the UI and the UX, the feel of using the thing is fantastic. Um, and so it's it's neat. I, I hope people have a chance to look at it, and I think some people will find that it's a real pleasure to use. It also automatically sets the gain for you. So if you're just, you know, you play a few bars, hit a button, wait for a moment, and then go on, and it's got a ton of dynamic range at the input. The design of it makes me think of like a, a Google Home. This is your your tabletop recording studio sort of thing. That's right. You know, it was just featured in Backpacker magazine as a great device to go for a hike with your, you know, your fluke or whatever the portable instrument is that you have. Um, it's got lots of different applications. Um, so the mic is built in? Well, it's got two inputs in the back with phantom power, so you can plug in externally or you can use, as I'm doing now, I've got uh, an AT... 4047 plugged into one input, and I'm using the Omni capsule in the front of it, um, and I'm recording two tracks at once. 
So uh, it's neat. I hope I hope people have a look. As with everything that we do, you know, my fondest hope is that people look at it, think about whether or not it's useful to them, and let us know. Um, I would never be presumptuous to the point where I'd say, you know, this is the thing to end all things. Um, we just want to make things that are useful and helpful. Can't say fairer than that. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to play with them. It sounds like uh, great fun. I'm saying that as though I ever <laughs> make any music or have any time to make music, but uh, <laughs> it j- just sounds like a really cool toy. Listen, Jonathan, thank you so much for making time to come on the show. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you. If people want to find out more about what you're doing or what Isotope are doing, are there any particular places you would point them on the internet? Well, the isotope.com site has a bunch of interesting blogs and other things. Some of them are focused on tech and some are focused on techniques. There's a wealth of information there. So that's that's probably a good place to start. And for you personally? Uh, well, I have my book, which is Audio Mastering Essential Practices, um, which is kind of a, a balloon ride over the practice. So, um, But I think it gives people a, a good sense of the core values of the practice. And you'll probably find me at AES conferences, and you'll find me at NAM and and NARIS events, and so on. Yeah, we didn't even get a t- chance to talk about the the book or your lecturing um, at Berkeley, but maybe uh, another time. Um, fantastic, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for for being here. It's uh, it's been a pleasure. Well, I'm flattered that you asked me. I appreciate it very much, and. Uh, as I said before, I appreciate all the good work that you're doing. So please don't stop, but get some sleep. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. No, that's okay. I will. It's, it's, we're okay. It's only 10 to 11 here. It's not too bad yet. All right. Um, that's brilliant. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ian. So I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. Always great to have uh, a guest like Jonathan on the show. Um, let us know what you think. Go to themasteringshow.com forward slash review and leave us a message uh, telling us that you liked the show hopefully please don't leave a message saying you didn't like the show because then nobody else will listen to it and we wouldn't want that but if if you enjoyed this and uh, think other people would like to hear the show too that would be a, a fantastic way of showing your support John thanks for helping out and editing the mixing the show as always thanks to Kaylee Law for allowing us to use his music and thanks for listening 